Well, good morning and thank you again. Thank you, Karen, for supporting us today. We are gratefully appreciative of all of the efforts that are going on in the background to bring you all a long three hour presentation this morning. We will take a break every now and then to give you time to get up and stretch your legs. Uh, we're uh, gonna have several presenters today from the Georgia Department of Public Health, as you see here on this slide. I won't go through each one of them as you'll meet them individually as we come to their parts. In addition, I also wanna recognize the Alliant Health Solution team on today uh, to include Donald Chitanda, Paula St. Hill, and you'll be hearing a little bit later at the very end of the presentation from Erica Yumakune. We certainly want to thank our partners today, most especially the Department of Public Health, for without them, we would not be able to bring you this uh, training today or any of the other trainings that we have been doing under the Strike and Support Team grant that they are working under. We also want to thank the University of Georgia for their participation as well, and you'll hear more about uh, some of the benefits of, of their work very shortly in the presentation. Our objectives today are many, and so I'm not going to go over each one of them. For the most part, we're going to hear about the University of Georgia package that will be coming to you, a resource box and everything that's going to be in that box. Uh, and then you're going to have examples of some training around some of the articles and resources that are in the box. In addition, we'll also be sharing some tools and resources for risk recognition as well as quality improvement initiatives. At any time, as Karen said earlier, if you have any questions or have comments or thoughts, please enter them in the chat box. We will be monitoring that very closely today. And uh, we want to hear from you because we want this to be as effective as possible for you to be able to take back to your nursing homes and be able to set your programs up or enhance your programs if that may, if that's the case. At this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our friends with Georgia Department of Public Health, Teresa Fox and Renee Miller. Teresa and Renee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mel. Uh, we're, we're going to start the morning by talking about the facility infection prevention resource box that we've developed for your use. Bios are here. I'm going to let Teresa introduce herself. She'll do the last half of our presentation. Uh, I'm a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for many, many years and an infection preventionist certified for almost 20 years. Our, our objectives are to go over the box today and talk to you a little bit about the tools. We won't talk about all of them, but we'll talk about some of the tools and how you use them. As Mel said, we are working as part of a grant and it's a partnership with University of Georgia and Alliant. And we've all worked together to develop this package. Uh, we were, there are a number of us that were hired two and a half years ago to help with COVID um, management in long term care and other senior facilities. And we have at this point been to all of the nursing homes in Georgia and many of the assisted living facilities. Uh, it, we hope we've been to most of them, but they're a little bit more difficult to, to find. Um, we may not, we, we came up with resources because we saw things that recurred in every facility that we knew would be helpful to you. There may be things we've missed, and if there are, you think of things you need, please let us know. The resource boxes, they are prepared to send out 1,000 resource boxes. Every skilled nursing facility in the state will get one. And many of the uh, assisted living facilities or personal care homes will get them as well. Some of the, the hard items that are in there, there is an APIC long-term care text. That's our uh, so Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. It's the latest infection prevention guide for long-term care that will come to you. You will also get a quick reference uh, for microbes. It's a microbiology book that will be helpful to you in looking at your um, culture and sensitivity reports. You will each get a glow germ kit and we will have a presentation later uh, about that. You will get an N95 fit test kit, um, probably under separate mailing, but you will get one. And then you also get some 
resources and tools that we've come up with. And as I said, if you have other tools you would like to see, other resources you need, please let us know. There are about eight or 10 categories of things that we're gonna talk about, most of those. The first one I'm gonna talk about is NHSN. And I suspect that you all are familiar with that because during COVID you had to report. Um, and so we have resources in our packet on uh, how to use NHSN, how to get into it, and also the McGeer criteria. As you know, you've had to report all of your COVID, your vaccinations, your positives, your negatives at times, um, your therapeutics, all of, all of those things. You will in the future, and we're not sure exactly when, you will have to report influenza vaccination. This has been um, done in acute care and long-term acute care for years, and, and I'm sure that it will come to you very soon. Um, COVID submission is still required every week. Okay. There are a couple of websites that we've linked here that would be helpful to you. This one is more on how to how to sign up for um, NHSN, how to get into it. But there's also a roadmap that talks about education. And you can learn more about NHSN from that. We've included an article, and this one is especially important to us. Namali Stone is the headline position on here. She's been near and dear to us, uh, um, supporting nursing homes in Georgia for years. And so that's the latest article on the McGeer criteria. And here's also a worksheet. Uh, it's much like the NHSN worksheets, but it shows you exactly what criteria to look at and how to categorize your infections. Another category that we have in the packet is antibiotic stewardship resources. There is a whole page of um, references, and we've picked some of the, the major ones that we think will be useful to you, the core elements and some of the CDC education. CDC has made a page of core elements that's just for nursing homes, and, and that's helpful because you don't want to have to wade through general healthcare uh, information to find out what's appropriate for you. So there's an uh, education and a checklist for antibiotic stewardship. Hopefully most of you have already worked on your antibiotic stewardship and have it, the program well underway, but we can always use a little extra boost now and then. Of course, the core elements are that you will have leadership, your, your uh, nursing home administrator, your medical director that will be on board, there'll be accountability. You'll, you'll have a pharmacist that'll help you um, they are just such a great asset to your facility. You'll take actions to decrease antibiotic usage as when it's unnecessary, track, report through your QAPI, and provide education for your staff. One of the things that we found in all of our virtual and on-site visits that are opportunities for improvement um, and I would say probably in acute care as well as long-term care, are the refrigerators, microwaves, ice machines, ice scoops, and those kind of things. So we've included a sample policy, um, and all of our policies and our logs, our Excel spreadsheets like this sample temperature log, uh, you can use, you can do whatever you want with them, you can um, make different columns on your spreadsheet. You can fix them to, to how they work for you. Ice machines, remember if you have a, a bin type ice machine, it definitely has to be cleaned and disinfected according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, ice chest, you know, the, like the styrofoam things that you take to the tailgating or whatever, those need to be cleaned every day. We have seen some pretty dirty ones. Um, ice scoops, I think we all know not to leave them in the bin. I, I don't think I've ever seen one left in the bin, but they do need to be cleaned daily as well. 
Refrigerators have to be labeled. If you have um, resident food, it has to be labeled that. If it's medication, it has to be labeled. And if it's laboratory uh, specimens and uh, reagents, it has to be marked and also have a biohazard symbol on it. Um, thermos thermometers need to be placed in all of these refrigerators. And think about where you're placing them. Uh, you, if you have one, in the refrigerator and it's right under the freezer, it may run colder than the entire compartment. If you put it toward the door so that every time the door opens, it may be warmer. So you need to put it in somewhere that it's going to give you an accurate temperature every time you, you take that and record it. Refrigerators have to be cleaned and disinfected routinely. Um, we all know that Refrigerators and microwaves in our homes and in our workplaces tend to get a little uh, nasty if we don't keep up with them. All resident specific items must be clearly labeled with the resident's name and date. Your policy should say when they will be discarded. Um, I, this has got to be a, a very difficult thing to keep track of. Uh, we've looked in refrigerators, we've seen uh, half torn fast food bags and uh, you know, things that can't be sealed. Um, you really want to try to make sure that with the food that you put in there for your residents is correctly um, packaged and labeled. Your temperature should be read for your refrigerators at least daily, but your medication refrigerators have to be uh, recorded twice a day. And if the temperature ranges are not an acceptable, your temperature is not an acceptable range, you, it needs to be documented what you did about it. Um, once the service is complete, the temperature should be reread and documented as acceptable. And one of the things that we did provide is a temperature log. Um, and you'll see, I, I know you can't see specifics, but the wider column is your corrective action. If the uh, temperature is out of range, the ranges are on the bottom. The far right column is your reread once it's corrected. This should be done every day. Um, these you can, you can manipulate if you'd like, but these are the general columns that you do need to have. Another category is infection prevention risk assessment. <clears throat> now, what you need to be doing an infection control risk assessment anytime you have, say, a change in service. Um, you have dialysis brought in your facility, or you decide to be a ventilator facility. Uh, there's other restrictions with that too, but um, anytime you have a change in service, anytime you have an, uh, uh, an outbreak, you may want to do a, a risk assessment. If guidelines change, regulatory requirements change, uh, one of the things, one of the times that we've used it in the last two years, I'm sure that you have all heard, when we started reopening, when CMS came out and said, we could go ahead and, and have small group sessions, we could have um, community communal dining, things like that. We ask that you do a risk assessment to make sure that you had things like enough hand hygiene products, that you had the ability to clean between settings in your communal dining, um, that you had enough space to social distance. And those are the kind of things we looked at then. This is more of a general um, risk assessment that you can use any part of it, and you can also manipulate it as you'd like. Your infection control risk assessment does need to be um, conducted annually, at least, and you develop goals and objectives for the next year or the next time until you, you re review it and revise it. Um, and then at the end of the year, you look at what you've done and you decide where you need to go next based on your risk assessment. All right, Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa Fox, and I'm another one of the IPs, and uh, I will say I have been doing infection control a long time, just like uh, 
Renee has. I've been in healthcare well over 40 years. And the last few years, I have worked uh, mostly with long-term care. And so I'm going to continue what Renee was talking about, some of the resources that we have provided in our uh, resource box. First one we're going to talk about is outbreak investigations. So you will notice that we provided two tools that we're going to talk about right now, and that's the sample outbreak policy and the notifiable disease poster. The sample outbreak policy we have is it is there as a sample. You can use it to set up your policies, but it gives you what is the theory behind doing an outbreak and your possibility, including the 10 steps for an outbreak. What is different about this policy you will see is some of the things that we learned during COVID outbreak was that we needed to be prepared before it actually happened. So we sat down and we have looked at all the people that normally are available in a nursing home, like your administrator, your housekeeping, your charge nurses, your infection preventionist, and your, we looked at them and tried to assign possible jobs that you would provide in that. So you got communication. So who, what kind of job in an outbreak is the responsibility of that communication person? What is the responsibility of a charged nurse if uh, the outbreak is occurring on their floor? And a lot of this is you're not always going to be there as the IP. You may be in Hawaii enjoying the beach when an outbreak occurs. So we need to have a system available so that the outbreak investigation gets started quickly and handled systematic. So that's the goal of the outbreak policy. So you will find that in your packet. And as I said earlier, you know, the outbreak investigation always includes those 10 steps for the approach. You know, we talked about what the team is going to do. We're going to talk about how to confirm the existence of an outbreak. We're going to talk about how you're going to go about uh, verifying the diagnosis. Uh, a lot of us don't use develop or appropriate case definition because we think that sounds hard. But it's really not. You're just going to say if Miss Jones was exposed to 10 people and all and Miss Jones symptoms is this, this and this, this is what we're going to be looking at and the other cases for a possible outbreak. And then we're going to, you know, we don't want, I want to emphasize, you see number eight down there, it says implement control measures. Well, these are done in 10 steps only for educational purposes. They're not intended to be step one, step two, step three, step four. Okay. All of these things or lots of these things will be going on exactly at the same time. So just keep that in mind. Just as soon as you identify what you think the organism is, then you start implementing your control measures to stop the spread. So we hope by providing that policy that we give you some ideas about where to go on your policy. Because I can tell you what I normally see. It's a one pager that says we're going to investigate an outbreak. You know, that is really not very helpful to anyone, but, I, you know, you have to have a policy and it does meet that standard. You got to have one that's really, you need to make that policy usable and defined enough that someone could follow it in your absence. This is the latest notifiable disease report for Georgia. These are the... Uh, conditions or diseases that is necessary for you to report. We did include this in the packet, so everyone will have that. Just remember that those do not last forever. You have to keep that updated. So every year you ought to check the notifiable disease condition reporting and make sure that the copy that you're working off of is that year's current poly, uh, list. So you know, now we've got, there's a lot of resources that we included on hand hygiene. You know, we, we talk a lot about hand hygiene, but it is very, very important in all healthcare settings. And it's something that is really easy to do. 
but it's really hard to get others to do it and do it each and every time that uh, it is necessary. So what we've included this time is we have included the resources and tools. The first one we did was the CDC hand hygiene help in healthcare settings, and there's the link to that one. And then as you'll see on the graphic to the left, we all are aware of those five moments from hand hygiene, right? That infographics is there. We also gave you their guidelines are from the WHO. And uh, there is a really good program in there about how to set up a very extensive and specific uh, hand hygiene uh, compliance program. So if you're interested, that is a really good resource to go for. It even tells you how to train your observers, uh, what they should be looking for. There's all kinds of sample uh, forms for you to use. And so we also looked at what are the components of a successful hygiene program. And we talk about education. And then we talk about the availability of, of supplies. You know, we want to remind you that CDC recommends alcohol based hand rubs to be in the residence hallways and residence rooms and in your common areas. And one of the things that we noticed when we would be out physically or virtually in a building was the placement of those dispensers. Let me remind you that there is an ADA guidance or guideline standard, whatever you want to call it, about where those should be placed. Just remember, they should be between 42 and 48 inches above the floor and at least one inch away from electrical sources. So when you start looking at where to place those, you got to look at, is it convenient for my staff to use? Because I can tell you, if you put that hand hygiene on the far side next to the window, straight across the hall from your door, your staff is not going to go over there to clean their hands before they leave the room or before they see bed one, okay? Think about where's the most complete, uh, play, uh, most accessible place for them to use them. We see them a lot of times in the bathroom. Well, you know, we don't want you using an alcohol-based product instead of washing your hands with soap and water for activities that go on in a bathroom. So I would really consider moving those so that you have them in a more accessible and appropriate place. But just keep in mind about the 42 to 48, because a lot of them, I'm short, and I would walk up to them, and I'm having to look up to use the dispenser. Well, first, that's a hazard to my eyes if that happened to spill and gets into my eyes. So just keep those in mind. We included auditing tools for your hand hygiene, and we'll talk about a little bit later about how they work. We also included how to measure the quality of cleaning, and that's going to be a glow germ. And later on, Mary's going to show you some of the ideas and how to use that glow germ that will be included in your packet. And we also provided you specific instructions if your staff is using pocket sanitizers, how that is to be done safely. So let's talk a little bit about PPE. You know, when we talk about PPE, we talked about standard precautions. There's information on there about what those are. We also provided transmission-based precaution signage. And I think you're going to be really thrilled. We've worked really hard with, the, with UGA and Alight to provide Georgia-specific transmission-based precaution signage. Uh, we will have a session just a little bit later uh, by Regina and Sue Bonnell. And they're going to talk about where those signs are, what they include, and how what our idea is of how those should be used. We also included something that we didn't normally see in um, facilities, and that was the educational material. If you remember, you know, we're always supposed to provide resident, family, 
and visitor education as part of our transmission-based precaution activities. What we would see is that they were the staff or the people that were implementing the transmission were not really sure what to do. So we have included a educational sheet. Those educational sheets, we would like for you to print them and provide them a paper copy of them in that. And as you can see on the left, we have already designed a uh, example or a diagram of what we would like for your transmission-based precaution rooms to look like. And Regina and then will go into a little bit uh, more depth about how that should be done. We have training resources. We ought to want to remind you that it is the facility's responsibility to train, educate, and provide all the necessary PPE for performing transmission-based precautions. It is your staff's responsibility to adhere to your guidance. So just remember, you've got, don't ask me to put on a, a mask that I have to walk all the way to the uh, nurses station to get one. You know, as a healthcare provider for a hundred years, I assure you, your staff's not going to do that on a normal basis. They might do that if you're watching or you're doing your audits, but on a routine basis, I, I would be really surprised if they would do that. We have also included the links for the CDC donning and doffing signage. And we gave you some uh, information. It's an appendix. It tells you what we think would be a good idea to put on your isolation carts. And this is Foxology. I'm going to throw this out. I like to see when you set those isolation carts up that your signage that needs to go on the door is on that cart with them. So your staff does not have to hunt it, does not have to search for what I need to be on there. And also, I always had the education sheets in there so my staff could go ahead and do the education. Just remember, you know, the guidance says that you should implement transmission-based precautions timely. So timely doesn't mean that you got that report on Saturday and when the IP came in on Monday, she implemented that uh, transmission-based precautions. So it's to have your system set up so that it, your nursing or whoever you think can implement those, that that is implemented timely and it's documented on the patient's medical record that that was done. You should also document when the education was done for the family. That just closes that loop. And one of the reasons I'd like to talk about that is there have been some major lawsuits lost in this country due to, say, one example was a grandfather was in the hospital for uh, MRSA, his daughter brings her grandchild in to visit him. Yep, the signs were on the door. Everything was there. But no education was provided to that family or that resident. The child goes home, ends up with a major bloodstream infection for MRSA, and they lost a lawsuit because there was no documentation where the education had been provided for that family. So it's not only just a good practice, but it puts in an extra safeguard for your facility. The next thing that we're gonna talk about, we will tomorrow at 8.30, there will be a, a presentation that will be hosted from the same group about how to do a respiratory protection resources and plans. But in our kit, as we stated early, there will be a fit testing kit there will be the OSHA references on how to set up that program. And then we included an educational PowerPoint for your use to um, teach and train for the fit testing and doing your program. And the last tool that we have, we'll talk about a little bit later, is what we call the PPE audit tool. And we talked a little bit about cleaning and disinfecting of refrigerators earlier. Now we're going to talk about it from the perspective of 
uh, environmental services. We included a sample policy about our ideas of what a cleaning and disinfection uh, policy should look like. We included the resources or links to the resources for what's called the Strive Environmental Services Training Modules and Tools. And those tools were developed through a grant from CDC with national uh, experts in infection control. They are four teaching models. Those models are provided in Spanish as well as English. They are uh, CEUs available for them. They are set up so that you can use them for uh, initial training, annual training, or periodic training. So if you had an outbreak and you, you think it may be linked to your cleaning policy, this would be a great way to re-educate your environmental services staff about the cleaning. It includes uh, the fundamentals of an HAI program as well as the cleaning. And you will see to the right, we have this graphic is included in that Strive program, and it talks about how to clean a room when it's occupied. So those are things that we use every day. It gives us the sequence that those should be done in. And remember, everything has to be done systematically so that we don't lose anything. This is just, uh, miss anything. This is just a great tool to use to use for your staff for training that. Uh, there is also another graphic that was put out by APIC. I don't have a picture of it on this one. It's called the S cleaning and the use of disinfected method. That's another really good tool to use for training your environmental staffs. And we also talk a little bit about product required information on uh, cleaning products. And this slide shows you a good graphic that when you're teaching all of your staff, not just your cleaning and uh, environmental staff, but what you should be looking at and for on a cleaning label. The graphics are EPA approved products. We included the list for that should say COVID, CRS, and CDF. It tells you what should be on there. It's mandatory what can be uh, left off if you're transferring them to another bottle. That information is all available. It also talks about the CDC water management opening guidelines that we are all have in our facility. This is a checklist that we have created. Actually, we have created you three checklists that we think that might be beneficial to you. Uh, these are in the form of an Excel spreadsheet. So if you have Excel, you can use these. They are open and mean they're edible. You can come in there, you can add to, you can remove, you can do whatever you want to on these. These are for your use. You can put your logos on them because we know a lot of people like to do that. But we have a, a daily audit checklist for cleaning. We have an environmental rounds checklist. That would be if you worked with us before in person, when we talk about going from room to room and we look at everything in the room, we look at lots of other things. That's where we catch a lot of that things about refrigerators or in your cleaning area. Uh, you know, you can't have anything within 18 inches of a sink without a splash guard. All of those things are included with the correct uh, what we would like to see happening on this environmental checklist. We also have a cleaning and disinfecting audit tool and that we're going to go through a little bit later about how that would work. But just remember, these are all, and when I talk about these are not a hard copies, you will actually be getting a thumb drive. So if your computer can use a thumb drive, then you will be able to assess and print and uh, edit it, uh, all these tools from that one point. It, as Renee said earlier, if you think of something or if you have something that you have created that you think it would be beneficial for us to share, you know, we're all in this together. So we would love for you to send us your creations 
And if you're willing to share, we would love to share them with others. You know, this has been a traumatic use of, uh, of uh, our time in the last two years. And we have learned a lot. And one of the things that we'd like to emphasize to you is don't forget the lessons learned from COVID. Those can be applied to many, many multi-drug resistant organisms, uh, flu, you know, think back, what did we learn about COVID that we could apply with the upcoming flu season? So let's keep this ball rolling and improve our programs in long-term care. This is the tool that we came up with. You will see it's very simple that when you look at your WHO tool for hand hygiene or some of the others, you will see they are a lot more uh, in depth. What we tried to do on this tool was to make it easy and simple for you to use. You will notice that from this one tool, you can do hand hygiene, you can do PPE, and you can do cleaning and disinfecting, right? This tool is set up for you to do 30 observations. I want to emphasize with you, if you're going to do statistical valid uh, calculations of compliance rates, you have to have 30. That's the minimum. So it's the way we're talking about doing this will make it very simple. We know there's other times through the, the five uh, moments of hand hygiene for observations other than did they do it or didn't they do it? You know, you should always be watching to make sure that they're using the appropriate technique for whether they're using an alcohol-based hand rub, which means you don't put it in your hands, wrap it around a couple of times and uh, wipe the rest of it on your clothes. That means that you spend a 15 second to 20 second time period, making sure that you cover all of the same areas that you would cover if you were doing soap and water hand wash, right? That apply and then you, you should always be watching to make sure that they're doing the 15. But this one is set up just for the two opportunities. You know, it would be great, but if we can get them to do it before they go in and before they leave, that's a huge improvement over what we see most of the time now. When I visit facilities and I do what's called my down and dirty compliance, the average rate is about 40%. Okay. So, you know, make sure that you are doing those observations so that you have a true representation of what those hand hygiene compliance are in your facility, right? Because, you know, if you really have a 95 to 100% hand hygiene compliance, that probably doesn't need to be on your risk assessment for one of your goals. Right? There's a reason that we have that on there every year as our goals. And make sure that your goals are realistic, you know, that you can actually improve. If your real hand hygiene is 60% and you think within six months you're going to go from 60% to 100%, that's a really, really lofty goal. So just think about that when you're writing your goals and writing what interventions that you're going to get uh, to implement to uh, increase those compliance rates. PPE, very basic, and of course, uh, cleaning and disinfecting of equipment. And I'm sure a lot of you've heard me talk about what I call my uh, walking talks. That would be when you're standing at the end of the hall, looking like you're doing something else, and you just watch people come in and out of rooms or go out at mealtime and just watch the delivering of trays. Those are really good opportunities to see your hand hygiene compliance in action. It's really easy to get 30 of those when you talk about doing it that way. We also give you at the bottom the instructions on how to uh, calculate your hand hygiene compliances. And uh, we will uh, talk about that a little later. And um, so be sure that we are doing those things 
and this tool is available. As I said, it, you can download it to your Excel and do all of your calculations and stuff on this one form. All right. Does anyone have any questions at this time? If not, Lisa, at this time, we do not have any questions in the chat box. Just want to remind everyone of all the great tools you have shared today, especially the audit tools and um, be sure to pull these down. The slide link has been dropped over in the chat box so that you can get the whole slide deck. And with these tools, know that um, most of them with your audits, you want to incorporate those into your QAPI plans as needed or as necessary. So thanks so much for sharing all the tools that you've already made for everyone. But at this time, we do not have any questions or comments in chat. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Sue Milligan. Um, I'm going to start us off on transmission based precautions and then we'll, Regina will be taking over content information after I do a brief introduction. Thank you for joining. So our presentation is going to be um, on transmission based precaution. Ms. Regina Howard will be providing our content today, and here's her bio. She's quite outstanding. I encourage you to read through that. Um, I am Sue Milligan, and I have been part of the team for the last um, two, almost two and a half years. And I have really enjoyed my time working with uh, DPH and um, learning a lot from these very seasoned IPs. Our objectives for this morning is um, we've got them stated here, but I do want to read through them to be sure that everybody um, is understanding of what we want to achieve during our talk. We want to um, assert standard precautions, and that's going to be highlighted as SP from here forward, as the foundation for preventing the transmission of infectious organisms in the healthcare setting. We also want to cite the definition of scope of SP, transmission-based precautions, which you will see as TB. P moving forward, and then enhanced barrier precautions, EBP. And I'm sure that uh, we're all excited about that because there is a lot of questions surrounding the enhanced barrier precautions. We want to state the significance of implementing transmission-based precautions based on clinical presentation. We want you to understand how to document the chain of infectious components uh, required for the transmission of infection organisms. And then also we want to cite infection control recommendations for various components of healthcare. Thank you, and Regina will be up next. Good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for the skilled nursing facilities. This package, this box that you're receiving is like an early Christmas present. I am so excited for you to receive all of these resources and tools that's going to assist you down the road. So it just made my heart glad to see all that will be provided for you. So my name is Regina Howard. I am one of the IPs with the Georgia Department of Public Health. I've been a nurse for many years and I've been an IP for at least 25 years. So I'm going to talk to you today about transmission-based precautions. So before I get into the transmission-based precautions, I'm going to talk to you about the chain of infection components. To have an infection, you must have a host. Okay, to have an infection, you first have to have a host. And the hosts are the individuals who many times come into play, there are many factors that come into play to determine the susceptibility. Now, those who are more susceptible to infection are our elderly population and our very young population. Our hosts can also be those that are immunocompromised, malnourished. So you have to have the host first. Then you have to have an environment where organisms will grow. And that's based on the, the temperature, the humidity. Uh, in some environments where people live, where they have multicultural generations, they have several 
generations in some cultures that live together and it causes crowding and that can lead to infection. You also have to have an agent that's either a virus, a bacteria, there are also chemical agents. Uh, there may be uh, malnourished. These are all chain of infection components where someone may be susceptible to having an infection. Next slide, please. Modes of transmission. Modes of transmission will vary depending on the type of organism that you're dealing with. So you can have direct contact where there's a person to person infection, or you may have indirect contact where you may uh, go into a patient's environment and contaminate yourself if that room has not properly been cleaned or the equipment utilized by the patient has not been properly cleaned. So modes of transmission, direct or indirect. Next slide, please. Now, your first tier of infections are standard precautions. Standard precautions hasn't always been called standard precautions. Uh, back in the 70s, I believe it was, uh, standard precautions were referred to as body substance isolation. It was back then that CDC decided that they need to come up with uh, techniques where they need to protect the healthcare staff. So that's when they came up with body substance isolation. I believe it was around the 1970s. And if you will recall, in the 80s, we had the upsurge of HIV and AIDS. And that's when CDC came up with universal precautions. And there was a very big concern about the use of sharks in the environment and healthcare workers getting stuck by needles and so on and so forth. And in 1991, OSHA came about with this bloodborne pathogen standard to protect our employees from these various situations regarding uh, needle sticks and exposure to blood and body fluids. So, next, so what they were trying to do was provide an environment that was safe for the health staff. And that's how they came up with this standard precautions that we utilize today. So it went from body substance isolation to universal precautions to standard precautions. And standard precautions is standard care or routine care that we provide to everybody. Everyone is on standard precautions. Standard precautions means that in any given situation, you utilize PPE depending on what it is that you're doing. So. Standard precautions applies to everyone. So if you're in a situation, say for instance, you're changing a dressing, there could be a possibility you may get splatter in the face, splatter in the eye. So you utilize masks, you use goggles, whatever you need in that situation. So standard precautions applies to everyone. Every patient that you take care of, standard precautions, use what you need to in that situation to protect yourself. Okay, under standard precautions, we have the second tier. We have the second tier, but before I get to the second tier, I want to talk a little bit more. Would you go back to that slide, Sue? Thank you. So it was at some point, I think it may have been, I don't know how many years ago, but CDC came up with the safe injection practice. They refer to it as their one and only campaign. One needle, one syringe, only one time. So what had happened was there were various outbreaks of hepatitis C, HIV, and hepatitis B. So what was occurring in the health field, there were people who were not utilizing good technique as it pertained to syringes and needles. And believe it or not, in these United States, there were outbreaks because people were utilizing the same needle and syringe going in and out of vials. 
So it was a real concern there for a while because we've been having a lot of outbreaks. And even now, from time to time, we'll have an outbreak every year because of improper technique by people who are utilizing needles and syringes. So I really like this one and only campaign by CDC. And I try to push it for these skilled nursing facilities so they will educate their staff regarding needle and syringe use as far as technique. Also under, uh, under these standard precautions, we have the use of the N95 respirator mask for aerosol generating procedures. So several of these things came along later on because we didn't do these things initially in the health field under uh, standard precautions. Okay, next slide, please, Sue. The second tier of precautions are your transmission-based precautions. So initially, transmission-based precautions were your contact precautions, your droplet precautions, and your airborne precautions. And it was later on that enteric precautions came it was added under this second tier transmission-based precautions for situations such as C. difficile and norovirus. Next slide, please. Enhanced barrier precautions. All of these now were under transmission precautions that were not under there initially. So your enhanced barrier precautions, fairly new, I don't know, last 10 years or so, I'm not sure. But in your enhanced barrier precautions, what you're doing in this situation, they have started in the skilled nursing facilities. You will wear gown and gloves when you're dealing with residents who have medical devices, who have a draining wound and so on and so forth. Because CDC, what they found was there was a a quiet transmission of multiple drug resistant organisms. So that's why they implemented enhanced barrier precautions to prevent the transmission of multiple drug resistant organisms. Because many times our elderly are colonized. They may not necessarily have a wound per se, but they can be colonized with MDROs. So when you're performing intimate things like bathing and toileting and things of that sort. CDC wants you to wear gown and gloves for enhanced barrier precautions. Okay. Aerosol contact precautions. This is a situation where if you're utilizing nebulizers, giving treatment, you should take precautions and wear an N95 mask to protect yourself. You may in this situation also need uh, goggles if you're gonna have that kind of contact. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk to you about epi epidemiologically important organisms. They're defined as potentially drug resistant organism transmission in the healthcare environment and the concern for today is we're seeing a lot of organisms that are resistant to antibiotics. And I'm very concerned about this because we're seeing pan-resistant organisms. Those are organisms that will not respond to any antibiotics. To me, that's very scary. And many of those organisms we're seeing among the carbapenemase producing organisms as Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. And we're taking the opportunity to educate facilities now, acute care facilities, as well as our skilled nursing facilities about these pan-resistant organisms that we're seeing, these multiple drug-resistant organisms that we're seeing. Candida auris. So these organisms where no medication will resolve that infection caused by these organisms it's very concerning to me. So it's, I'm very serious when I talk to skilled nursing facilities about their technique and that hearing, when you have a patient on isolation, 
no shortcuts. Perform your hand hygiene. These are so important in not spreading these organisms. And again, uh, these organisms, that's, again, is why we're utilizing that enhanced barrier precautions. Next slide, please. Part of your packet, you will see these the signage. These signs, Renee and Teresa worked very hard with Georgia Tech and Alliant in making these signs for our skilled nursing facilities. They worked very hard, as you can see. The signs we're looking at now are your contact precaution signs. First sign is the sign you would place on the door. The next sign for contact precautions on the right, it explains your role when you're placing a resident on contact precautions. So this will, I can't see it, the print is very small, but uh, it shows you how to put on your gown, how to take off the gown, and it tells you about the equipment and supplies in that room. Preferably that resident should have equipment dedicated just to that resident. You should disinfect the equipment if you're sharing it, but it preferably it's just designated for that resident on contact precaution. So again, cleaning and disinfecting come into play in that situation. Next slide, please. This sign, again, as Teresa emphasized, families should be educated as to why their loved one is on contact precautions. Again, it should be documented so you'll have a record indicating that you educated the family on why their loved one is on isolation and educated them as to how to behave in an isolation environment where their loved one is on contact precautions. So this is very helpful. And again, document that that education has been provided. Next slide, please. Enhanced barrier precautions, I talked a little bit about that. Again, there's a sign for enhanced barrier precautions. And everyone in that situation must perform hand hygiene when entering and leaving that room. Doctors and staff must be compliant as well. Wear gloves and a gown for the following high contact resident care activities. Again, when you're doing activities with this resident as assisting with dressing, bathing, transferring, changing linen, those are situations in which you should utilize gowns and gloves when you're doing a dressing change, when you're feeding, when you're doing wound care. And again, the signage on the right explains everything that should occur in an enhanced barrier precaution situation. So don't confuse this with contact precautions. There's a difference. And we'll get into that later on. Next slide, please. Again, this is signage for the family's education, for the resident family and visitors. Again, very important to, pro to provide education to your family and respond to any questions or concerns they may have. And again, do not forget to document. Next slide, please. Here we are. What are the differences between enhanced precautions and contact precautions? Contact precautions require the use of gown and gloves on every entry into that resident's room. Regardless of the level of care that's being provided, gown and glove for contact precautions. Dedicated equipment if is preferred. We understand there may be situations where that cannot be, we ask that you clean and disinfect in between if that's not the case, but preferably under contact precautions, dedicated equipment. Place in a private room, or if that's not possible, you cohort with residents that has the same MDRO. Restrict them to their rooms except for medically necessary care, including restriction from participation in group activities. 
So under contact precautions, there's a lot more restriction and uh, the residents should not be allowed to leave their room. It's also intended to be time limited when implemented. So there should be a plan to take this resident off of contact precautions at some point, because you know, it can really have a detrimental effect regarding the mental state of that resident. So when you place a resident on contact precautions, you want to get them off as soon as you can. Enhanced barrier precautions, different from contact precautions in that an enhanced barrier precaution, you require the use of gown and gloves again for high contact with the resident. Enhanced precautions, the residents are not restricted to their room. The residents can participate in activities. It's intended to be in place for duration of the resident's stay, as long as they have, as long as they have those medical devices in place, these residents will remain on enhanced barrier precautions. Next slide, please. Again. More of these beautiful signs, the droplet precaution signs, and it talks, everyone must wear a mask, and they must clean their hands when entering and leaving that room. And the staff must wear masks, gown, gloves, and so on and so forth. And beside on the right, is explains the droplet precautions and what is required in that situation. It also talks about how you to don and doff in that situation where your resident is on droplet precaution. Next slide, please. Again, education, 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 very important for the family and Teresa went into depth about that, how important it is to educate the family and to document. Next slide, please. Contact enteric precautions. That, in, that involves GI disorders where residents are placed on isolation. They may have, uh, they may have diarrhea. They may not have been diagnosed. You may have a resident that has diarrhea. And until you determine what's going on with that resident, that resident should be placed on contact enteric precautions. So everyone must in that situation again, when they're entering the room, they must clean hands with soap and water in the situation where, especially when we're dealing with C. diff, we use soap and water in that situation. And there's also on the right signage explaining the expectations when you have a resident on contact enteric precautions. Again, donning and doffing uh, is documented on the signage. So everyone will understand what is required when they're entering contact enteric precaution. Next slide, please. Again, uh, a sign that will explain to the family why their loved one is in contact enteric precautions. Again, document, respond to their questions and concerns. Do not evade their questions and concerns. And if you don't know the answer to a particular question, you ha always have your IP there. Hopefully. <laughs> Next slide, please. Again, aerosol contact precautions. Everyone must, including visitors, doctors, and staff. Again, cleaning your hands. You can't emphasize that enough. After entering and leaving the room, you need a respirator in that situation of aerosol contact precautions. You need eye protection gown and gloves, the door should be kept closed and dedicated equipment for this person in aerosol contact precautions. 
And I like this sign, the aerosol contact precautions. And I like the pictures where they have for the staff and what the staff is responsible to do. Again, uh, donning and doffing. Hand hygiene is always in order. Next slide, please. Again, aerosol contact precautions, information for the resident, family, and visitors. Next slide. Airborne respirator precautions. Restricted visitation for this situation here. When you have a um, resident on airborne respirator precautions, they usually require a negative pressure room. And my understanding is there are not any negative pressure rooms in skilled nursing facility. So many times I imagine this person may go to an acute care facility. Airborne respirator precautions is explained again in the sign on the right. And in airborne respirator precautions, it, the implication is you're going to need a negative pressure room. And again, hand hygiene is always in play and the room needs to be closed and the patient should be uh, on isolation. And when you have a resident in isolation, the negative pressure should be monitored in that room. Uh, you should have a way of monitoring the negative pressure and documenting negative pressure. I remember back in the day, we used to take a tissue and place it at the base of the door. And you see that tissue sucked into that room and it's an indication of negative pressure. Some rooms, they have these balls at the top of the door where it tells you whether or not that room is on negative pressure. And that should be, that's a room that should be tested daily to determine whether or not you have negative pressure. Now, if you have negative pressure in skilled nursing facilities, I'd be surprised. But as far as my knowledge, there's no negative airborne pressure isolation rooms in skilled nursing facilities. That's usually uh, in acute care. Next slide, please. Again, educate the family why their loved ones require negative pressure. Those who are negative pressure, uh, they may have tuberculosis, uh, measles, chickenpox. Those are situations where you would utilize uh, negative air pressure. Next slide, please. Here we have the isolation signage placement and you have your trash bin and you have your table where all of your supplies is located. Again, I had to remind several facilities where doffing occurs. So when the person is in that isolation room and they're removing their gown and gloves prior to exiting, on that door they're facing, should be a doffing sign. So people are very good about putting the signage on the outside door, which is good. But many times they forget to put the doffing sign inside the room on the door where the person will be exiting. That's where the doffing sign goes because that's where they will be doffing their gown and their gloves. So remember that. The doffing sign goes inside on the door. So that person will see that doffing procedure when exiting that room. Next slide, please. Okay, these elements to prevent transmission of infectious diseases. Now this slide is going to talk about the support the I he needs. I found I've been talking with many facilities and many times the infection preventionist is the DON. 
And that disturbs me because they cannot properly do a good job as an IP when they're wearing two hats. So not only is this something new they're learning and coming in IP, there's a lot of information to it. And for them to have to do director of nursing and be IP as well, I think it hinders the education they can receive relative to infection prevention. So it really concerns me when I see the GON has to wear two hats, which is the case in many situations uh, today. So some elements to prevent transmission of infectious diseases is to have administrative support. IP needs administrative support. They need to talk infection control. How can I assist you? What, what do you need? What can I do to facilitate this position? You need an infection control professional, someone really with a background in infection control. You need infection control policies relative to education and so on and so forth. You have to teach in orientation the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standards. You have to teach a plethora of things regarding infection control and orientation. And not only in orientation, but this is every day that you're there. So infection control education is ongoing. It never ends. And I have a reference there for the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard. The IP should be able to do surveillance for healthcare associated infections in their facility. They need to know about urinary tract infections. Are we having an issue? Are those foleys being pulled out in a timely manner? Or are they questioning every day? Does this person need this Foley? You need adequate staffing for infection control, infection prevention. You need a commitment to a safety culture, to a culture of safety. You need a commitment to safe work practices. And again, that safe work practices, one of the things always come to mind that one syringe, one needle, one time. So wherever medications are being uh, performed, dispensed, there should be signage up there reminding your staff the proper way of uh, utilizing your syringe and your needle one time only. So there has to be a commitment to safety culture. Administration has to be part of that commitment to support the infection preventionists. They really need that support, especially now in the skilled nursing facilities where this information is so new because there's so much involved with infection control. And it's not something that you can learn overnight. So the IP really needs the support of administration to do a job properly. Ed education of healthcare workers, that's a daily, daily thing relative to the IP. Edu you have to educate your patients. When the patient has a resident, I should say, has an MDRO, you, may, you need to be able to explain to that resident. You need to be able to explain to that family. You need to be able to respond to their questions. So that means you need time for education to educate yourself if you've never done this before. So mm -hmm. when you have to do the job of the DON, and the job of an IP of which you know nothing about, it's very difficult. So we really need administrative support in, this, in these types of situations because you're not gonna have that IP very long if it's an IP just learning about infection control. You're not gonna have them very long if you do not have, if they do not have your support. So I'm just trying to emphasize uh, this is so much of this is new for the skilled nursing facility. So they need your support. 
Next slide, please. Questions. Gina, thank you so much. You and Sue, you have certainly given us a lot of information. We do have some comments and questions in the chat right now, chat box right now. So I'm going to try to go through those. Uh, we had a question about the resource boxes, and I want to thank Teresa Fox for answering some of these questions as we've gone along. The resource boxes should be received, we hope, by the end of this year, if not a little bit before the end of the year. Uh, for the audit tools that our friends with Department of Public Health have shared today, uh, they're not currently on the website, but if you reach out to your DPH HAI team member, and we will have a list of everybody's names and emails toward the end of the presentation today, but you can reach out individually and ask for those to be sent to you. There was another question about are the signages and resident family staff education uh, to be used two-sided, both sides. And um, so, Teresa, do you want to come on and answer that? Or I will just um, add it at the very end or try to answer with what you've said. I'm erring down to try to find that. The backside is in, well, I, Teresa, do you want to come on and answer that one? Sure. When we developed the signs, those signs were developed to have a, to be t printed two-sided. You would put the front side out on the uh, residence door, and then you put it up so that your staff can lift it, and it tells them things about how you're going to transport that person, uh, what PPE you have, what are the possible organisms it could be used for. So it is HIPAA compliant, but we just put those instructions on the back, and then it tells the staff, uh, the visitors what PPE they should have. And then, of course, we're going to have the donning sign for our visitors as well as our staff on the door, right? And then the selected education for your residents will be that flyer. And I would just print several copies. And I put in the chat, if you noticed, all of that information is color-coded. All the things that have to do with the uh, contact aerosol, is all in pink. So your staff should be really easy for them to give the correct education and the correct signage on the door. So we would like for you to, if possible, if you print extras, that you do them in uh, color. And in the resource box, we didn't mention that, but you will be getting some sample uh, signage already printed and laminated for your use. We don't know that you, that would be enough. So um, we just gave you an example and you're welcome to use those. I do highly encourage that you, once you print them, especially if you print them in color, to laminate them. They're really easy to use that way. Then all you have to do is when the, uh, the rooms are being cleaned, they take the signage down, EVS does when they're finished, they clean the sign and return the sign to uh, wherever. If you keep them in your isolation carts, they clean it and put your isolation carts, or they clean it and take it back to the nurse's station. But that will just make sure that, one, they stay nice and neat. You know, none of us like that paper rolling up and gets really nasty because a thousand people touch it. So just be sure uh, that was how I would suggest you use them is in that format. We do on the picture slide, that it is hanging there, but that was just for uh, visual on this uh, example. In addition to that, I wanna add that when these were designed, there's also a space at the bottom where you, with all of our logos, you can add your company logo as well, personalize it and make your own, make it your own uh, for your doors. And I have one last, uh, Mayor Whitaker. I think you have asked a question. If you could come on and um, add a comment as well about the signage. Yes, thank you, Mel. Um, the reason the, the door was set up that way is the facility that I visited to take the pictures. When they looked at the signs, they felt that having the back visible would be more helpful to their staff because they didn't have a method of hanging it where you could flip it without ripping it off the door every time. And also they printed the 
family education on the door as well in case a family member were to get to the room before a nurse could go educate them. And so um, we set the door up the way they would want it set up. So um, that that's why it looked that way. It was not intended to be set up that way, but that is how um, that particular facility would set it up. So that's how we did the pictures. All right, we have one last question or another question in here, maybe I should say, instead of taping signage on doors, is it okay to use a ring type hanger? You mean like hang it on the door? Like they have like a command strip and they're gonna hang it on the door? We'll, we'll go with that. Uh, re, uh, yes, yes, that's exactly right, Teresa. Uh, I don't think there would be an issue with that, except it's going to get turned over. You know, it's not always going to be outward facing for everyone to see. That would be my only issue with hanging it that way, is that you want that front side out, the one that tells you exactly what you have to do. Because if it gets to the back side, you guys know as well as I do, nobody's going to stop and read that. You know, they're not, and I can't see very well. And the first thing I'm going to do is look at it and think, I don't know what that says, but I guess it doesn't apply to me. But whatever works good for you guys, it, it's your practice, it's your facility, and uh, you use them how you see fit. I would like to add our goal for the signage that we have done is not for them just to be used in nursing homes. We're hoping to spread the Georgia Alliance and uh, DPH signage to all healthcare signs. You know, it would be great if we had a consistency across the state. So it doesn't matter if you're in a hospital or if you're in a nursing home, your people that go to visit or if you share staff everyone would be aware of what those slides look at. So that's our ultimate goal, is to create a statewide implementation of this signage. Thanks so much, Teresa, for that explanation. We have brought you a lot of information this morning, so now we're gonna start the second half. Where we'll bring you even more. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mary Whitaker with the Georgia Department of Public Health. Hi everyone, I'm so happy that you're here with us today. Um, my name is Mary Whitaker, as she said. I have been a, a nurse for a very long time and um, I've been doing infection prevention for about 20 years. And I'm across a continuum of care, a lot of uh, long-term care as well as ambulatory care and acute care. And I am excited to talk to you guys about GlowGerm uh, kits and all of the fun things you can do with it to help your staff um, learn more about hand hygiene and uh, surface contamination and things that they can do to keep themselves and the residents in your facility safe. Let me flip to the next slide. So um, the obje objectives for this are to introduce you to GlowGerm and demonstrate the use of it for hand hygiene competency as well as to audit surface cleaning practices um, in your facilities. So why use GlowGerm? Why not just have people wash their hands? Well, the purpose of GlowGerm is it gives a visual tool. When you put that on your hands and wash them and then put your hands under a light, it shows you right there what you missed and the areas that you consistently miss. You know, most people um, miss their dominant thumb because when you wash your hands, your thumb sticks up, right? And so most people miss it if they don't intentionally do that around the cuffs of their hands, um, around jewelry, and in the nail beds consistently get missed. And using glow germ helps to highlight that. Sometimes seeing is believing. We all believe that we do a great job washing our hands, um, myself included. But I can tell you, even though I teach this, I don't always do the best job. And glow germ helps show that to me in a real way. It also helps with um, aseptic technique and general infection prevention. Um, the biggest thing is never assume that your employees understand the critical nature of these simple processes. Without proper hand washing, without aseptic technique and in general infection prevention and control, there's just no way that they can be 
successful in keeping themselves and your staff and residents um, safe. So you need to teach them. And not enough can be said about the importance of cleanliness and proper, proper hand washing and infection prevention. We can do all of the transmission based precautions. We can do safe injection practices. We can do catheter care. But if we don't have clean hands when we do those things, we're going to make people sick. If we don't have clean surfaces, we're going to make people sick. So we need to be sure that our staff understand aseptic technique when they're touching and, and like inserting a catheter or anything and how to make sure their hands are clean before they touch that IV line or that catheter or feed a patient. Um, and they need to be sure that they're doing that well. So that's some of the things we're gonna talk about today. So why did we pick blow germ? We pick glow germ because it's easy to use. There's a liquid or a gel that comes um, in your kit as well as a powder. Um, and these contain plastic simulated germs um, and the lamp illuminates them at the end so you can see what's on your hands. Um, both are easy to use. They both have um, different uses, I guess is a good way to put them. Um, and it's a great way to test the effectiveness of your workers' practices, whether it's hand hygiene, cleaning a surface, and there's some other fun things I'm going to talk about at the end that you can do with this, um, this kit. Um, for hand washing um, training, blow germs applied to your hands like a lotion, um, and then you wash your hands and you take it off. Uh, see what you took off when cleaning. And then for surface cleaning, you can use either the powder on horizontal surfaces throughout an area, or you can use the gel on more vertical surfaces or harder to clean surfaces um, like light switches, doorknobs, toilet flush handles. The big thing is remember it has to be a solid surface. If it's something that has like a porous like fabric or um, like you know how on light switch covers where the, um, the screw goes in that holds the plate in place, um, it can get stuck in there and you really can't get it out. So um, be mindful of that when you're using it. Um, and then after you do this, you would have them wash their hands or clean the area as usual, and then use your ultraviolet light and see just how well they did um, and make it fun. And we'll talk more about that later. So next I wanna show you, this is what um, your kit is going to look like. It has um, the powder and the gel and a little light. It has some training in it um, to help you use it correctly. And I just took a picture of everything kind of laid out so you could get a good idea of what that looks like. Um, it's a great resource for you guys to have and to use as you go about training your staff with um, hand hygiene and surface cleaning. And like I said, the most important thing is make it engaging and fun and seeing is believing. And that's really the goal and the, the benefit of using a product like Glowgerm is that um, it kind of dispels the myth that I think I do a great job cleaning my hands and kind of shows me the truth about it or that I do a good job um, surface cleaning. I, I laughed and when I said I was gonna do this and I thought I need to do this at home and then have my husband clean our granite countertops and see so I could show him that he doesn't do a great job. And I still might because, well, I think the seeing is believing would work really well for him too. So um, make it fun, um, make it challenging, and um, we'll talk as we go on about some different uses. So hand washing. There's some um, specific indications for hand hygiene. In your kit, you will have the five moments of hand hygiene from World Health Organization, as well as some resources from CDC and um, World Health Organization to help you with that. But some really sp important specific times that you need to clean your hands. So before you have any resident contact, even if you think, I just did it, you know, I just, I just did it you know, just a minute ago, I'm good. We touch things in the environment and in our, on ourselves without thought. Um, Sue Milligan, my one of uh, my partners on the DPH team, she laughs at me because I cannot help it but touch my face. And you probably should pay attention like then how many times I do it. Um, and you'll see that it's actually quite frequent. So I would need, I, that's why it's important to clean your hands before you touch the next resident, especially when you're in semi-private or ward rooms where you have three or four 
residents in a room, you need to find a way to make it easy for your staff to clean their hands between the encounters within that room. So, um, one of the times that we saw that happen a lot was I'm in taking care of the patient by the door and the patient by the window drops something and wants you to pick it up. Well, if your staff member has to walk all the way to the door to hit the hand hygiene dispenser or to a sink in the bathroom, they're probably not going to do that. So they're really gonna just reach down with their dirty hands and pick up that item and hand it to the other patient. Well, they just cross-contaminated from one patient to the other with whatever's on their hands to the object that they gave to the second resident. Donning gloves. So everyone um, has a we, that we see thinks, well, I wore gloves. Why do I need to clean my hands? So gloves should be used when a healthcare worker has contact with blood or body fluids in accordance with standard or universal precautions. So gloves are used if you're touching in non-intact skin, mucous membranes, um, or as um, a friend of mine once said, if it's wet and sticky and not yours, you should have gloves on. So that's just a fun way to uh, maybe remind your staff to do it. Another thing is when inserting urinary catheters, IVs, or other invasive devices that don't require surgery, you need to clean your hands very well before doing that. And then you need to maintain that aseptic technique. So a big one we see with starting IVs, and um, I'm sure we've all um, witnessed this, if not been guilty of it ourselves, myself included, is I clean my hands, I put on gloves, I'm binding the vein on the patient, and then I clean it with the alcohol pad, and then I pull the finger off my left index finger, and I hold the vein, and then I sit, insert the, the needle into the vein. Well, I just contaminated, right, and I broke a septic technique. Another thing is with inserting Foley catheters. When you're inserting Foley catheters, it's often very difficult to maintain a septic technique if you're doing that process by yourself. Best practice is to use two people whenever possible. So you have someone to help maintain the position of the patient while the other person can maintain a septic technique and get that catheter inserted with the least amount of contamination possible. And then some indications for hand hygiene after um, contact with anything is whenever you're leaving one resident's area, either their environment or their person. So remember that semi-private room, if I'm working with the patient by the door, before I leave that area, I need to be able to clean my hands so I don't contaminate stuff, the rest of the room with whatever organisms might have contaminated the area that that particular resident uh, occupies. Obviously, after contact with body fluids or excretions or non-intact skin, wound dressings, that kind of stuff, when I remove my gloves, I need to clean my hands every single time, even when I'm going to put on a clean pair to do another um, task for that patient. Between clean, dirty and clean procedures, if I'm messing with their catheter and then I'm going to put a clean gown on, I should change my gloves, clean my hands, and then put the clean gown on. Does that make sense? Um, we want to really be thinking about what am I touching that's contaminated or dirty, and before I touch anything else, I need to change my gloves and clean my hands. So, um, and that's a really, um, that I, I can't emphasize enough how much time you really need to spend talking with your staff about that. Have them throw out ideas. Ask them, when is it the most challenging for them to clean their hands? Um, when you talk about these things, is there a time where they sit there and go, ooh, I don't do that, and then address that. Help them be part of the solution. Have them give you suggestions on where you should put those alcohol-based hand rub dispensers. Ask them, where is it that it's the hardest? What processes of care make it difficult for them to be successful? And then your work begins to help remove those barriers to success. So if it's, well, the only dispensers all the way at the door and I do most of my care over here, maybe it's putting another dispenser over in the area they do most of their work. Maybe when where the dispenser is, when the door's open, they can't get to it. They have to close the door to get to it and you might need to put it on a different wall. So those are the things to really think about. And then make sure you have a method 
to ensure that those dispensers stay full. Um, having the dispensers on the wall and empty do, do no good. So we need to make sure that they have those dispensers and have access to a sink to clean their hands when it's indicated with soap and water as well. So um, that sink really shouldn't be used for anything else like dumping tube feeding or soda or food type things in it. It has been linked, um, doing that practice has been linked to the development of biofilm in your drains. And that biofilm can cause a plume when the water uh, is run that can result in uh, drug resistant organism infections in the patients and residents in that room. So it's very important that your staff understand that the hand hygiene sink really is just for cleaning your hands and have a different method for disposing of those other things. All right, so hand washing technique. Um, this takes much longer than people think. And if you have a timer, um, having someone actually time what 15 seconds is, is really a powerful um, demonstration of that time. So you wet your hands with water. It doesn't have to be scalding hot, um, just warm water. Apply the soap and rub your hands together with friction for at least 15 seconds. Now, you wanna make sure they're not just you know, doing this. They need to get between their fingers. They need to get the backs of their hands. They need to get their nail beds really well. They need to get their thumbs around their wrists, any jewelry they have. They need to move that around and make sure they clean in and around that. It's really best practice to not wear a ring with a stone and a much better practice to wear just a flat band. Um, also, um, you know, I can't help myself, so I'm going to bring up artificial nails and long nails here. It's really important that your staff understand that those um, artificial nails, and that's anything that you can't just take off with nail polish remover, is very different uh, and difficult to, to clean around than your nail bed. Um, there's a ridge there. Um, they are porous. Things do get underneath them, and you can't get them cleaned, and they have been linked to infections in patients. So it's really important that that's part of it. And you really don't want the nails to expen ex extend past the tip of the finger. And that's really important when you're um, talking with your staff because one, it's hard to clean up under those nails when you're trying to get your hands clean in a hurry. And you can scratch patients and you can also puncture your gloves. So it's really important that that's all part of your hand hygiene. So they're clean and they met that 15 seconds and then they need to rinse their hands under the water, start with their fingertips and rinse their hands off. Use a disposable towel to clean their hands and dry their hand to dry their hands, throw that in the trash, and then they need to use a clean one to shut the water off. Because most people don't think about that and they reach out and just grab the handle and shut it off. Well, if I did that, what did I just do to this hand? I contaminated it, right? So you need to be sure that you teach your staff about that as well. And there's a link here in the presentation for you to um, get some more information for your staff. All right, so right now um, we're going to show you a video demonstrating uh, from GlowGerm how to use their product to do hand hygiene competency. Hello, and welcome to GlowGerm How To. My name is Krista, and today we're going to be doing a hand washing demonstration using the GlowGerm gel. The GlowGerm gel is designed to be more user friendly than our originally formulated oil. It's great for use with children and the general public. For this demonstration, you will need the following items. Glow germ gel, soap, warm water, an ultraviolet light, and paper towels. Place a small amount of glow germ gel, approximately the size of a nickel, into the palm of your hand. Rub your hands together, rubbing the gel in like you would normal hand lotion. Be sure to get the backs of your hand and in between your fingers. Now, place your hands under the ultraviolet light to view the glow that exists prior to hand washing. Now, perform your regular hand washing. While the CDC recommends using warm water, soap, and at least 20 seconds of scrubbing, it can be helpful to follow your normal routine to see where you, your students, or your staff need improvement. The demonstration can always be done a second time using CDC guidelines.
After you have washed and dried your hands, place them back under the UV light. You will now be able to see all the areas you missed due to improper washing. Pay special attention to your thumbs, cuticle beds, and between your fingers. Complete removal of glow germ with normal hand washing is more difficult if the skin is chapped or cracked, indicating that bacteria can also be harder to remove. Following a regular hand care regimen, using lotion at least twice a day can help you to avoid this. This has been How To With Glow Germ. Thanks for watching and see you next time. All right, so um, in that video, uh, you saw a few things that um, probably made you go, hmm, like she didn't use a paper towel to shut off the water. And these are the things, I use this video, it's from GoGerm, but I, I used it intentionally to make you look for those same things in your um, facility. She didn't turn the water off with her with a paper towel and uh, she kind of rinsed her hands from uh, the dirty part of her arm down over her hands. And so those are things that you would watch and use as teachable moments with your staff as well. So a couple things to know with the glow germ is make sure you shape that bottle really well because the little uh, glow in the glowing uh, particles will settle to the bottom. So make sure you shake that bottle really well. Um, their written instructions tell you the size of a quarter. She said a nickel, but if you looked, it was really the size of a quarter that she put in the palm of her hand. And make sure you spread it really thoroughly um, when they put it on and, um, and cover the hands completely around the nails and cuticles between the fingers. If they have excess, they can um, blot it off with a paper towel. Um, all of that's fine. Um, you might have some folks that are a little the texture might be a little off putting to them, but it surely will wash off and um, maybe that'll encourage them to clean their hands well. And you want to be sure that you have them clean their hands as they normally would. Um, they can always go back and do it a second time. That's really important that they see what happens in real life when they wash their hands and where they miss so they can um, learn to pay a little more attention to those areas. So um, when you place your, their hands under that light, you want to make sure that there's not um, lot, lots of bright lights on in the room. Um, it will make it harder to see the glow and you want them to really be able to see what's on their hands. Um, so that little bit darkened room, obviously it can't be pitch dark, but just don't have the big lights on overhead. So make sure that they're, they're um, in a place where they'll get the most benefit from that UV light. Um, make sure um, they can um, have the opportunity to learn what the recommended hand hygiene is um, and have an opportunity to go back and rewash their hands. The effort that is required to remove the simulated germs is really equal to that of removing most bacteria from your hands. So it is really a good one-for-one uh, -one demonstration of, of what it really takes to get your hands clean. Um, that's a question I would get fairly often from um, my employees like, oh, but it's much harder to do this than just to get germs off your hands, and that's not true. So when um, when you do use the, glow, the, glow, the light to check for the glow germ left on their hands, make sure you're looking um, like down between their fingers and all around their nail beds and underneath their um, fingernails, those are some areas we miss a lot. And then any jewelry, um, especially if they like wearing their um, ring with a stone, that's a really good time to show them what is collecting in that ring. And that might be a good um, way for them to stop doing that. And those germs that stay behind are really intended to show them where they have opportunity to improve their hand hygiene. All right, so now we're gonna have a video about using um, glow germ to see how well your staff are cleaning surfaces. Hello, and welcome to our glow germ round two video. My name is Krista. Today, we will be testing cleaning practices using glow germ surface cleaning detection gel. For this type of demonstration, you will need the following items. Glow germ surface cleaning detection gel, Q-tips, a rag and or paper towels, soap, 
preferably a surfactant cleaning solution, water, an ultraviolet light, and a non-porous surface. This type of demonstration can be used to unknowingly test the cleaning practices of your staff or to simply demonstrate the importance of surface cleaning. First, we're going to apply a pea-sized amount of surface cleaning gel to the top of a Q-tip. Next, you're going to apply the gel to any area where you would like to test cleaning practices. Again, please remember that it should be a non-porous surface. We like to do these types of demonstrations in high touch areas, such as doorknobs, light switches, or simply on top of a counter, like this. Next, use the other end of the Q-tip to rub the surface gel in so that it's not visible to the naked eye. You can apply a small amount to the top of the light switch, remembering to rub it in. Now we're going to look at the areas where we've applied the surface cleaning detection gel with the use of an ultraviolet light. Now Chelsea's going to clean the surfaces. For the purposes of this demonstration, Chelsea did just a quick wipe of the surfaces. We're now going to show you how ineffective cleaning can leave residue behind. Now we're going to give the surfaces a more thorough cleaning using not just the cleaner and a paper towel, but also warm water and a little bit more elbow grease. As you can see, while the switch came clean, there are still traces of surface cleaning gel left behind in the screws and the creases. This is part of why it is so important to use non-porous surfaces. It will be next to impossible to remove the surface gel from these small areas. As you can see, with a more thorough cleaning, soap and water, our surface has now come clean. However, you can see that the surface cleaning detection gel is transferred to the towel and Chelsea's hands. You can use this type of demonstration to show why it's important to wear gloves and practice safe hand hygiene so that you're not cross-contaminating yourself. This has been Krista and Chelsea with our Glow Germ How To. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. There we go. So in the video, they used um, a gel, which you can use the hand um, washing gel as well. Um, it works really well on um, surfaces that are more slippery like your um, the top of your toilet or handles. You can also use the powder uh, lightly on um, a horizontal surface as well. So that's some uh, uses for that. So you would lightly dust a small amount of the powder over a, a horizontal surface and use the gel on um, other surfaces. And then don't tell your staff that's cleaning that it's there and let them just clean the surfaces as they normally would. And then you can go back and uh, with your UV light and see how well they did and if there's areas that they need to do a better job. Another good use of this is to see if they're transferring um, those organisms from one surface to another. So if you put all the glow germ spots in the bathroom, there shouldn't be any in the resident's room because they should clean the bathroom last. And there shouldn't be any in the next room because they should use a different rag. So those are some um, kind of things to you think about when you're using it. And then um, use it as a teachable moment. I when I did this, I would I would always write down where I was going, where I was going to put it. And then I would trend over time if there were specific areas that were consistently missed. And I would use those opportunities identified to ed do education sessions with my EVS team, my housekeepers and their leadership on areas that maybe they need to pay a little bit more attention to or do a little further education on. Get the most out of this product that you can. 
um, make sure that you're you're getting um, as much use of it as you can as well. So what do you do with it? You know, it's great to have all of this information, but you got to do something with it. And that's where the charting your your tracking your results and um, trying to see where your opportunities are is so important. Because if you just do it and don't do anything with the data, you're not going to improve. So, as I said, select about five areas to mark with the glow germ. Write it down. Okay. I always would, if I didn't write it down, I'd forget because I'd get stopped in the hallway. And so I would have a plan when I went in and I would select rooms that would be cleaned by different staff. So I might pick a room on different units, different ends of the hall, depending on what the um, hospital uh, or facility staffing was with EVS um, that day. And I would make sure that I, I captured different um, housekeepers uh, in my in my audit for that day. And then um, I would go mark those before they were out, like when they were in their morning meeting, and then I would wait and I would. Typically, I tried to pick ones that were more at the beginning of what their normal routine was, and then I would go back later in the day and I would check. And I would track the areas that were missed altogether because there were some of those. I would track the areas that maybe they only removed part of it. And then I would look for cross contamination. So those things really gave me a lot of great information that helped both the housekeeping leadership and myself to target um, maybe a product that wasn't working really well. So were the rags they were using effective? Were they past their useful life? Is it is it that issue? Is the staff not cleaning before they disinfect? Cleaning is a two step process. So um, if they were just using the disinfectant spray and wiping it off, as you saw in the demonstration, that didn't work very well. You really have to clean first before you can disinfect anything. And so this is some information you get from that. The other thing with hand hygiene that you can look for is um, it's a good time to figure out where you have an issue um, and then have your hand hygiene campaign, have real life situations that are um, a problem. And um, also the other thing you do with hand hygiene is look to see where they contaminated other things. Okay. Did they get it on their uniform? Did they transfer it to other surfaces? Um, we had someone that had it on their hands and she was doing a demonstration like I am, and she's much like me. If you didn't notice, I talk with my hands and she would go around and touch different things. And by the time she was done with her 30 minute presentation, we told everybody stay seated. We turned the lights off and we went around with a blue light and we saw not just the things she touched, but the things other people touched, like their face, their clothing, their cell phone, all everything pretty much had glow germ on it by the end of that presentation. And it helped the staff see how easy it is to transfer something from one thing to another to another. So use it for that as well. Let them see what they're getting on their uniform and their face and their mask and everything else when they have the glow germ on their hands. And then give prizes for people who do the best job for hand hygiene and cleaning surfaces. I would have um, kind of a scale, you know, they got 100% of everything off, 875, 50, 25, whatever scale you want to use. And then I would mark that for each of the five areas in a room that I marked. And then whoever had the highest percentage of people of, of places that were clean got a prize. And I would do that like over a month. And when I went to present at their monthly staff meeting, I would give the, the person the prize. Um, you can also use glow germ to teach um, proper glove or PPE doffing. So you put a little, have them smear some glow germ on the gloves and then remove their gloves and then have them show their hands so you, they can see where they contaminate their hands. Like I said, glow germ has lots of uses and has a great, um, it's a great benefit for you. Seeing is believing and that's what this product gives you. This uh, is another uh, surface cleaning video that's uh, a bit longer, it's about 10 minutes that I wanted to put in here for you all to watch at your, on your time when you have it. 
and it kind of gives you some other ideas on things you can do um, to help your building be cleaner and make your infection program more effective through um, appropriate cleaning and hand washing. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Does anyone have any questions for me? Well, Mary, thank you so much for all of this information and um, the great tips of how to utilize, how to go behind and do your audits and cleaning. Again, those audits can be used in your QAPI plan for infection prevention. At this time, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll ask, is there any anything you want to add before we move on to the next presenter? I do not think so, um, and I will watch for questions in the chat, and if I see any, I will answer them there, and we can talk about them at the end of the uh, time today, if there are any. All right, perfect, and once again, the link to the slides have been uh, has been dropped into the chat box so that you all will have the information at your fingertips after this presentation is over. We do not have any questions or comments in chat right now, so Erica, we'll move on to you. For the last part of the session, Erica will be wrapping us up today. Thank you, Mel, and good afternoon. Oh, excuse me. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Erica Magne, and I'll be presenting the next section with you here. As I have progressed to move on that with the slides, just wanted to highlight our contacts with uh, in the Georgia Department of Public Health. They're listed here and actually also at the end of the presentation. So I'll be talking about risk recognition and infection prevention and control or IPC. Again, my name is Erica Umeakune and I am an infection preventionist and also an adult gerontology nurse practitioner here at Alliant Health Solutions. And I am excited again to be with here, here with you all today to discuss infection prevention and control um, based on uh, um, also my experience in primary care critical care healthcare administration and public health and how um, IPC is important across the board in all of those specialties and especially in the nursing home and skilled nursing facility setting. So here are the objectives that we have outlined today for this talk. So first I'll define what risk recognition is and its application to the healthcare uh, setting and also the nursing home setting. I'll also describe the Infection Prevention and Control, or IPC, risk assessment and uh, how to prioritize those IPC risks. I, I will also highlight the importance of surveillance as a tool for risk recognition and will provide examples about how surveillance can help inform your IPC risk and also the interventions that you do to, to reduce those risks in your, in your uh, residents and also among your staff. And then lastly, sprinkled throughout the presentation are tools and resources and links embedded on the slides um, that will, are helpful resources uh, as you uh, learn more about risk, risk recognition, but also as you could potentially use this, these materials to inform and teach uh, and train your uh, resident or your staff in your facilities as well. And also we'll be um, sharing some quality improvement initiatives and resources that can help with IPC as well. So let's talk about risk recognition. What is it? And I know you all are like, what? What is this? So risk recognition is basically the process where you identify a potential problem before it happens. It's an awareness of things that can cause harm to both your residents and your staff when you think about it. And it's an essential component to patient and resident safety as well as staff safety. Um, by using rec risk recognition, it allows you to minimize those harmful event events and the effect of those harmful events before they actually happen. And it also en enables you to take immediate action to make sure that um, you reduce that risk once it's identified, that risk of harm once it's identified. And you do that via three primary methods. One is that one is through prioritization. So that's looking at your risk and finding out which one, of course, is 
going to be the most harming, the well, excuse me, most harmful, or is um, a higher threat of harm to your resident or your patients. And we'll talk about more about that um, as we go through the presentation. But I've, also, my colleagues at G, uh, at the Department of Health have also highlighted that in the context of using a risk assessment um, to make sure that you're identifying your IPC risk appropriately in your facility, and you're able to rank those. And, and use that scoring and prior prioritization to better intervene and to plan ahead. And so once you've identified and prioritized your risks, you then want to mitigate that, meaning you want to lessen it. You want to take action to prevent it from happening or subsequently reduce the likelihood of that happening. And then lastly, with any intervention, anything you do, you always need to follow up and that applies again, like, even if you think about it in the clinical setting, if you know, your patient is at risk of getting worse from a clinical standpoint, you intervene, you provide the medication, you um, assess them, you continue to monitor them and then you, you, you follow up to make sure those interventions are working. The same applies to infection prevention and control. When you identify your risk, you're acting upon it, and then you go back and reassess to make sure that that's work, that's where that it's working and that that, that intervention is um, effective and also going to continue to reduce the risk of infection or transmission of a communicable disease in your facility. So before we even fully jump into what risk recognition is in healthcare, let's talk about how you use risk recognition every day. And if you see on the slide here, we have different buckets um, in, in, uh, here on the slide. And, and in this, we're gonna talk about like just again, how you use it at home, how you use it in your personal health and also your personal safety, and then how you use it when you're engaging and interacting with residents, and then how you use it as a, at, on a daily basis in your work environment. So actually, at this point, I want to stop to just encourage you all to take out some pen and paper or pencil and paper, or just have um, something that you can jot down, somewhere you can jot down your responses and potentially add them in chat because this session is going to be highly interactive and I really would encourage your, your feedback and engagement as, we, um, as I talk through some of these concepts. So if you would like, if, you, um, if you're looking at here on the screen, if you wanna go ahead and also uh, capture some of your comments in terms of um, what you think uh, you might be doing on a daily uh, basis to reduce the risk in these type of environments. And some of them, of course, they're probably a lot more. I only included a few. So if you have any feedback or ideas, just drop them back, drop them in the chat, chat for me. So let's just talk about home, what we do at home on an everyday basis related to risk. Um, when you talk about home security, I bet you, you know, you lock your doors at night. You're, you secure your car and your valuables. You, if you have an alarm system, you might set your alarm system, especially before you leave the house or at night. And what does that do? It helps prevent the risk or, or help deter the risk of theft and burglary, burglaries. So um, again, that's just another thing that you might be doing on a daily basis. And another one is fire and gas safety or cooking safety. Uh, my experience as a, as a burn intensive care Nurse, I have a, a profound appreciation and, and a heightened sense of risk when it comes to um, preventing fire or uh, fire, smoke inhalation, and, and gas poisoning. Um, so that's very near and dear to my heart. But think about all the things that we do at home. We install fire alarms, we uh, install smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. You might have a fire extinguisher somewhere in your house, especially in your kitchen. And all of that helps reduce the risk of fire and the loss of life, and of course, the loss of property. Or it may actually help alert individuals, um, yourself, or even, you know, like for example, the fire department, when you're having a fire, when your alarm goes off to help um, intervene quickly and prompt promptly to again, save life and also safe properties. Um, so those are just some things we, we think about in the home environment. Um, I want to see, are there any question, any um, additional thoughts here in chat? Any other comments about some things that you all maybe do, maybe do at home to reduce your risk of injury or harm? Okay, I don't see any. Um, so let's move on to personal safety. Again, here we, we, when it comes to your personal safety in a car, Majority of people wear seat belts because we know through science and research and the evidence that has come out over many, many years, 
that car safety is very important at re the reduce of risking risking um, to reduce um, the risk of um, death or severe injury in the event of a car accident. Um, and I also saw that someone put in the, you know, putting non slip rugs in your home, which is very helpful, especially if not only for you as an individual, but if you especially have any elderly uh, individuals living with you to prevent falls. So, thank you for that. Um, so, in terms of personal and health and safety, making sure that we don't have uh, clutter around our homes to prevent trips and falls and to make sure that we, uh, Eat healthy, we exercise, we maintain self care to help reduce the risk of chronic illness or injury later in life or even early on in life. And so now let's talk about, let's see, see some more comments coming through. Yeah, turning off your lights around your in your home, uh, reducing the risk of, you know, your power bill going up for sure, but also just the reducing the risk of any type of um, electrical problems potentially in your home if you're not there. Um, so yeah, great, great points. Thank you for including them in the chat. So these are what we do on an everyday basis that we may personally uh, take to reduce our risk of injury or harm. But now let's talk about like how this applies to maybe your residents and the patients that you take care of and the residents that you take care of, as well as your work environment. So some things that we do when we uh, have a resident, especially upon admission to our facility, we like to assess them, right? To look at their clinical condition, to evaluate their nutritional and functional and mobility status to ensure that certain interventions are in place to prevent further decline, the risk of decline or injury or falls. Also, for example, if we're doing completing risk assessments, thank you for putting that in the chat as well. For, um, you know, again, for a bit morbidity, morbidity, and also for um, to identify any potential cognitive or psychosocial or psychological conditions that may also put them at risk for adverse events or um, a functional or any type of mental uh, decline. And also, when you think about our medications, there, of course, are certain medications that we need to look out for to um, reduce the risk of um, drug drug interactions or increased side effects in certain patient or in certain residents um, because of their age or their um, also their their cognitive status. Uh, so those are things that again we do with our residents that are, again are related to recognizing risk and intervening. And that's from a clinical standpoint. Now let's talk about the work environment, what we do. In the work environment, there are a number of things that um, I know that administration do behind the scenes and also do um, through policy and procedures to prevent occupational exposures. Um, there's also the use of signage, which uh, both Regina and other, my other colleagues on the presentations today mentioned about how we use certain signage, especially on the, um, the doors of individuals or residents who may have a certain communicable disease or infectious disease um, that we want to reduce transmission um, with in our facility. So we need to make sure that we have appropriate signage to reduce that risk of both exposures to the uh, staff and also other residents or family members if they come into the room. Um, we also just in general use signage, for example, when we're cleaning our, our spaces or we're mopping or cleaning the floor. And what does that signage do? Prevent the risk of slips and falls. Like, um, so it's so important that we, we recognize just again how we use recognition every day in our environment. And of course, some of the IPC interventions that have already been shared, especially as Mary shared about hand hygiene, uh, making sure that we are cleaning and disinfecting appropriately, making sure again that we're using our transmission based precautions appropriately, and also through the use of immunizations, ensuring that. All of our staff and residents are up to date on certain immunizations that are very well known to help prevent the um, transmission of, of certain diseases and also bloodborne pathogens. So, just wanted to frame that for you. And, and as we continue to um, move through this conversation, please put your thoughts and, and ideas in the chat. So, let's talk about risk recognition and healthcare. So, 
risk recognition, as again, we just mentioned, it could be applied across different areas of our lives. And so when we talk about healthcare and our work environment and what we do every day, it's important to realize that healthcare, the healthcare setting in itself is a risk. And it's a risk for a number of reasons, especially to the residents and the patients that we take care of. So when you think about residents and also just patients in general, they're seeking care, they're receiving care. They are they are um, receiving care because they may not be at their 100% of their health or their wellness or fitness. And they're seeking and receiving care from us as healthcare providers and entrusting their care to us. And so um, because of their health status, it makes them vulnerable. Um, and it also increases the likelihood of them experiencing an infection, especially because, for example, the healthcare environment is full of pathogens or germs, a variety of germs and pathogens that if the, the resident may have been maybe at their own home, they may not have exposure to. So, you know, when you think about the number of residents in your facility and you think about the number of conditions they have and, and they, how they vary, and also the increased likelihood of them having a multi-drug resistant organism, as uh, my colleague uh, Regina mentioned, um, you know, it, it, it increases their likelihood of being exposed to something that they typically would not get at a, in their home setting. And then also, if you think about the, the care that we're providing in, in the healthcare setting, there's often a number of interventions that we use very quite effectively to help improve their health and, and functional status. And that's great. But then you also think about the risk that comes with that when you talk about invasive medical devices or lines like an IV, an intravenous catheter, or a Foley catheter, or indwelling catheter, or a PIC line, a peripheral, peripherally inserted catheter um, that needs to be maintained, or a central line, or an intubation tube that goes directly into their lungs. Those are all devices that are quite invasive and all, you know, of course, go into the body. That's what we mean by invasive. And so, although these, these treatments and interventions are quite effective at helping our residents uh, get better, especially if they're in, you know, we're helping them through an acute phase of illness, then, um, but, you know, it's, it's very helpful, but it also comes with risk. And so that's very important to understand. And then lastly, what we do and how we do it in our work environment also is a form of risk because our workflow, our daily practices, what we do and what we do well, and also what we don't do well has the potential to directly and indirectly impact our residents. So if we think about hand hygiene compliance or adherence to those recommendations of cleaning our hands very well, being mindful of how we're cleaning our hands, if we're thinking about um, the use of transmission-based precautions, um, especially um, for those that we know have, for example, an active infection or colonized with a multi-drug resistant organism, if we're not doing those things well, and then we go to another uh, resident's room, then we, of course, increase the likelihood and risk of transmitting a potential um, pathogen to that resident that will subsequently cause an infection or even colonization. So, uh, especially in terms of an MDRO, multi-drug resistant organism. So, these are just things we really need to think about as we're thinking, as we're considering, you know, how we effectively practice IPC in our workspace with among our staff and, and among our colleagues um, and how we're supporting that, especially in terms of also education, awareness, and reinforcement and empowerment, because I think what is very, very important is once you have the information that we've, we've shared all throughout today, and as we move forward with the, the resources that you're receiving, you're, you're going to be empowered to, to make a change because you have all the resources that you need to help successfully implement IPC interventions and an IPC program in your facility. And part of that empowerment comes with having the knowledge and the resource to do that. And so here, I just wanna encourage you to share this again with your staff and, your, and um, with your, your clinicians and your 
work environment because it really is a sense of empowerment, empowerment when you realize what and what risk are your uh, what risk um, occur in your setting and how you can effectively intervene. That to me is very empowering. I hope you all see that as we move through um, these these uh, next few slides. So. When we talk about drums in healthcare, we want to make sure that we frame um, what that means in, in a very specific context. So um, here in healthcare, we think about germs in, in terms of where they live and where they reside or a reservoir. And this is where, again, where the place they live and where they might thrive. And then, you know, when you think about, for example, the human body. And also, uh, germs might live in the healthcare environment. These are all places that um, you, um, when you think about um, where where certain interventions may be, take place or what may be helpful in terms of IPC interventions, you need to think about this in this context, both the human body and the healthcare environment. So, reservoirs in the human body are the skin the gastrointestinal system or the gut, the respiratory system and blood. Those are just examples. And then reservoirs in the healthcare environment include reservoirs um, within water or, or wet, wet surfaces or dry surfaces and dirt and dust. And that's why the environmental cleaning and disinfection is so very important. But then also it could be on devices that we may be using like our blood pressure um, cuffs or our thermometers or our pulse ox. Uh, devices. So those are potential reservoirs for germs. What's important, though, is to understand how those germs are transmitted from their reservoirs to um, another location in the healthcare facility or even to your residents or even to yourself as a staff member. Um, so when you talk about transmission of that, you think about the pathway. And this is the way for germs to be spread from their reservoir to another reservoir or to a person to infect. And so there are a few common pathways for germs to be spread from reservoirs through in, in healthcare. And that, that's by touch, when they're breathed in, or when someone is actually you know, kind of expelling them through their breath. Um, they occur through splashes and, and sprays in the eyes to the nose or the mouth, or they are um, transmitted or move from broken skin or unhealthy skin, and um, they, they just move around in the environment through those pathways. And so it's really important for us, again, as we're thinking about how these potential germs move from one place to the next, that we consider certain procedures and interventions that require, for example, breaking the, the patient's skin or allowing the germs in the patient's skin to get from their body to our hands, to their, you know, to their um, their bed, their table. I mean, just all, anywhere in their environment. So, you know, as we're thinking about these pathways, we're going to continue to think about ways that we can intervene to prevent this from happening. And my colleagues have already, you know, really addressed this very well in terms of using PPE appropriately, using standard precautions, hand hygiene, um, also just really knowing your risk by understanding what kind of devices you're using in your facility that may um, precipitate or uh, increase the risk again of a particular infection or, or just germs moving from one place to another. So yes, thank you for um, that comment. Yes, this is the slide that I was referring to in terms of risk recognition. And this specifically talks about reservoirs, the pathway, the reservoirs in the human body, as well as the healthcare environment and all of the common pathways for these germs to spread. And again, that's through touch, through breathing in, through splashes and sprays, and then by bypassing or breaking down the body's natural defenses. And also here on this link, you'll see a helpful resource uh, to CDC's um, project first line, which has a wealth of information, interactive resources, trainings, and information that you could use to help inform your staff and clinicians about infection prevention and control, but also about risk recognition 
and especially um, reservoirs and um, how certain germs transfer to one place from one place to another. So the link here is also on this slide. So again, as I as as I want to reiterate that there are a number of IPC interventions that reduce risk, and they're listed here. And it's many of which my colleagues have already shared, and that's establishing the IPC program and plan, having protocols for bloodborne pathogens and prevention of those, as well as standard and transmission-based precautions, uh, policies for your invasive devices like your IV catheter, your IVs, your and dwelling catheters, your central lines, uh, making sure that your staff wear PPE appropriately, ensuring environmental hygiene through cleaning and disinfection, appropriate air handling and ventilation, linen handling, and then also establishing a, a respiratory protection program. And hand hygiene, surveillance and reporting, resident, family, and staff education, as well as partnerships and communications and consistent communication with your state and local health departments, your laboratories, your neighboring facilities, and also your consultant pharmacists. So I'd like to take a pause, a, a moment here to pause and to um, query you all, and um, I would really like for you all to take a look at this picture and help me identify what the IPC risks are. And you can do so once you find the risk, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll see what we get here. So looking at this picture, what's wrong? Okay, I see a lot of you saying the mask, the mask is below the nose, so it's inappropriate PPE and the, the wearing and application of, of PPE is, is completely inappropriate in this, this picture. Okay, I see someone says that there's a hamper towards the back behind the healthcare provider. What's wrong with that hamper? And I also see, let's see, the shield, the face shield. Could you tell me what's wrong with the face shield? The face shield is on the computer, correct? Let's see. There are items on top of the soiled linen, it looks like, and it looks like it's probably some blood or body fluids on there, and they're just hanging out of the bag. So that definitely is an IPC risk. Excellent. This is so easy for y'all. You all are doing an excellent job here. So yes, you all have pointed them all out. So first, let's talk about the PPE hanging on the computer, which is a big no-no. Because if the PPE is clean, I mean, first off, we don't know if it's clean or dirty, but let's say that this is supposed to be clean PPE. Clean PPE should be stored in a way that it's obvious that it's clean. For example, on a labeled container or somewhere in a clearly identified area, and that's clearly identified as clean. Use PPE has germs on it, and if it's used, it should be thrown away, or if it's reusable, it should definitely be cleaned and stored appropriately. So let's talk about the mask, which you all pointed out very well. So not wearing a mask over the mouth and nose. So, you know, that is just a big no-no. And so germs can spread through respiratory droplets, and that make and that occurs, of course, when people breathe and when they inhale, and of course, they breathe out. And you know, for this reason alone, because of that risk, the uh, healthcare provider should be completely covering his nose and his mouth to prevent any type of uh, potential transmission of um, any any germs that may be in those respiratory droplets. Then let's talk about the overflowing dirty linens bag behind the healthcare provider. So any used linens um, that are are completely um, first off, any used linens should be appropriately discarded, and used linens should be covered and should always be marked in a marked bag or bin. And so in this example, that is not the case. And so it's very important for you. And in, in your facility to make sure that your your linens, your soil linen cart is appropriately identified and covered, and that it's out of a place where people could inadvertently walk by and touch them. So I have another picture for you. 
So imagine this is your medication prep area or some area where you're about to have um, uh, prepare, um, whether that's um, uh, nutrition or even just uh, like again, medications for your um, residents. What is wrong with this picture? Okay, so I see the Sharps container is overflowing, correct. The tongue depressor container is uncovered, correct. Yes, you have clean supplies close to the sink. There's a urine, urine sample on the counter that's not in a biohazard bag, great job. And of course, supplies are in a, in, a, in a splash zone because remember, we're thinking about where are our reservoirs, places that have germs, and wet areas, wet surfaces are one. So great job. Excellent. So there's one more that you all have not captured yet. There's one more missing, one more IPC risk that you all have not identified yet. I'll give you a few more seconds. Yes, great job. There's a trash in front of the vent. Great job. So yes, you all have identified all the risks and we'll go over them. So one, which you all all pointed out very well is the overflowing Sharps container, which is a huge hazard. So when Sharp containers are overfilled, there's a greater risk of accidentally getting poked with a dirty needle or a Sharps instrument. And it's important for overflowing or even when they're um, at the mark where they should be changed, it's important that you remove and replace uh, the Sharps containers often and before they become too full. And then also notice the urine specimen without a biohazard bag. So when a sample is collected, it's very important that the body fluids um, that, that are contained in that sample are appropriately identified and secured in a biohazard bag. Also placing supplies close to the sink um, is very important because as mentioned, those clean supplies could be inadvertently splashed with water as you're washing your hands. So those supplies should always be out of the splash zone and also covered and stored in a clean manner. And then lastly, blocking the vent. If you see to the bottom left side, there's a trash can that's blocking that vent. And a blocked vent can decrease the air handling system's ability to replace air in a room with new clean air. So if you see an air vent that's blocked by something mobile, like a chair or a trash can, it's very important that you move that item to improve ventilation. Great job. All right, last picture here. What IPC risk do you see in this nurse's station? Food, correct. I see, yes. The syringe. So we have a healthcare provider preparing medications in a public area at the nurse's station, gloves. Moving up and down the hall, there's a practitioner with gloves on. Lotion on the countertop. Correct. Yes. Great job, great job. So yes, as we're looking at the risk in this picture, let's start with the lotion. So tubs of lotion can easily pick up germs and bacteria from your hands. And a matter of fact, um, there have been a number of studies that have Im um, indicated the risk of lotion as a very effective method uh, to uh, transmit uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, one of the gram negative bacteria that often could be a, a multi drug resistant organism. Um, you know, it could be easily transmitted or picked up through lotion that's been used and sitting around and it can be picked up on your hands and then inadvertently passed on to patients, especially if it's not lotion that is approved by your facility. And it's also something that's being shared among individuals um, at the at the your, um, among staff or even at the nurses station. So just be mindful of that. Um, also, having food at the nurses station is a risk because um, food could easily get blood and body fluids on it, especially if um, you know you're if there are um, let's say specimens or biohazard bags or specimens that contain body, blood and body fluids around. Um, so you just need to be really mindful of eating in a place 
where your you know, patient care is ongoing. Wearing gloves between patients and tasks is also a risk. And if you see the healthcare provider to the very far right of the picture, it looks like she's come out of a room with some gloves, or she actually may be going into a room with some gloves. We do not know. So with that in mind, it's very important that you perform hand hygiene whenever you're putting before you're putting on gloves, but also when you're removing them. But you're also removing them um, in a place um, most likely right at the right outside, right before you enter, exit a resident's room. And of course, before you move on to the next um, resident or, uh, or, or before you just step out of that resident's room, you need to be taking off your gloves and performing hand hygiene. Um, also, healthcare workers handling a syringe, and that is a huge risk because one, we shouldn't be preparing medicines at the nurse's station. There is a certain area that medication preparation should be occurring. And then also, if you think about it, what if someone accidentally bumps her or if, you know, she may misstep or something like that, you have a live or an open needle that could easily um, hurt someone or potentially be contaminated, um, especially if you're about to uh, uh, perform a, um, a, a procedure or, uh, or provide some type of medication via um, injection. So, just in general, there are some, some things after um, we've completed the, that interactive session. We just want to make sure that you all understand that healthcare infection, health, uh, the control of infections in the healthcare, um, healthcare environment um, involve the, the recognition of the risk for germs and how they spread, and also the risk for how how germs cause an infection. And so, again, healthcare is a unique setting. And we consider germs differently in this place than other places. And there are certain infection control actions that we know very well um, help prevent germs spread from one place to another. So moving from the reservoirs to another part of the body, to another part of the healthcare environment, or to other individuals and staff. So knowing where germs live and how they can be spread can help you understand, as well as your staff, why infection control actions work to stop them from making people sick. And as highlighted by my colleagues earlier, this is where your IP risk assessment comes in. And the our IPC risk assessment is a process for documenting and prioritizing those risks, so that prioritization, and it's a systematic review of all the safety risks to residents as well as staff. And this should be completed annually. And also when you have risk, when your risks change, for example, if you're taking care of um, a new uh, patient population or if you've expanded your services. And, and um, also, even now, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, looking at the risk of transmission in our community and how that applies to some of the IPC interventions that we're going to take in our facilities. The IPC risk assessment, as mentioned, is completed by our IPs, but also with a multidisciplinary team that can provide insight and expertise in different areas that IPC affects. Um, it's also used to develop priorities and goals for your next year. And of course, it's a regulatory requirement. And as mentioned, um, there are templates and resources available through the Georgia Department of Public Health. And again, just looking at your IP risk assessment, you want to be sure that you're evaluating your facility services, your resident population, your and conditions, your medical devices and interventions. Uh, your healthcare personnel, uh, their particular risk, as well as your surveillance. And we're, when we talk about surveillance, we're talking about incident reports, hand hygiene compliance rates, your HAI rates, or your healthcare associated infection rates, your tuberculosis rates, or rates of other community uh, infectious diseases or communicable diseases, as well as your immunization rates. And as always, you, you need to reevaluate and look at your interventions that you've already put in place. Here we just talk about the analyzing and prioritizing risks, and you want to think of them in, in again three buckets, like the probability of certain of a certain event occurring, and you do this by evaluating the risk of um, any potential threat based on your historical data, your infection surveillance, infection surveillance data, again, the scope of services you provide, as well as your health department data in determining what um, 
what events um, and the threat of those events might be occurring in, in your community or, or within a close proximity of your facility. Also, you want to look at how that event may impact you, your patients, your personnel, and you do this by looking at the, you know, again, your patient population, their risk for illness, injury, infection, death, as well as the need to have more beds and also personnel to staff your beds and support um, your residents. And then lastly, looking at how well your organization is prepared to deal with those events um, through policies and procedures, and also, again, looking at things that you already had in place. So this is a really nice graphic here, and it just highlights how you work through risk recognition and your IPC risk assessment. So again, you want to make sure that you're assessing your risk, you're completing your risk assessments, and you're prioritizing those IPC risks, you're developing your IPC plan, you're implementing your interventions from that plan, and then you reevaluate or reassess. And that's a continuous cycle that is quite iterative, meaning that you know you, you build upon it as you go along and you change it as you need, but again, you have a systematic way to do that. Another part of risk recognition that I want to highlight and reiterate as my colleagues did is surveillance. Surveillance is so, so very important when it comes to risk recognition because it's a standardized process to measure and evaluate an outcome. And it's also a helpful tool to identify both risks and potential problems. And you use surveillance definitions, again, that's that standardized um, way to measure and evaluate a particular outcome um, to ensure that the same thing is being counted every time you're looking to count those events. Um, surveillance definitions also help provide meaningful comparison between facilities, maybe even between areas in your facilities. And it also helps you correctly interpret changes over time, as well as identify factors associated with certain HAIs. And again, it informs your IPC prevention effort, your IPC efforts, and also your targeted interventions. And again, surveillance can come in a, a, a range of, um, could be across a range of topics or areas, including hand hygiene, environmental cleaning, and of course, your healthcare associated infections like urinary tract infections, respiratory infections, skin and soft tissue infections, and multi drug resistant organisms. So let's take a moment to look at this data here and to, to, to potentially identify our risk of having a C. diff outbreak. So based on the hand hygiene compliance data reported in January and February, which facility wings are at increased risk of a C. diff outbreak? And just drop your, um, your, um, yes, okay, yes, we I'm have sorry. a call. Sorry to interrupt the yes. polling, uh, the polling just, um, popped up on the screen. Sorry for the delay and you can enter your answer by selecting the letter and then make sure you hit the submit button. Otherwise it puts a little hold on the getting the results. So I'll back to you, Erica, and just remember to hit that submit button. Okay. Thank you so much, Karen. So, yes. Let's answer this question. Where are, is our risk for a C. diff outbreak based on hand hygiene and compliance data in January and Feb February? And it's listed here on the screen. Give you about another 15 seconds. Yes. So it's majority actually identified the entire facility. And if we look at this, and that's correct, the entire facility, because um, if you look at our, our um, data here, first off, our data tells a story. So if you look at the data here in January and February, um, it, our hand hygiene rate, rates are, are well below, um, uh, let's say, let's say our goal is 90% at least, but they're well below 90% hand hygiene compliance across the facility. And almost all areas have a concern, have, um, are, are well below even 70 or 75. So in those, in, in those, in that, those two months, hand hygiene rates are not high. 
but they continue to improve over time. And so as you see, by the end of July 2022, our hand hygiene rates are at 92.8%. So again, this is a way that you can just look quickly look at your data to look at what in IPC interventions are needed to help reduce your risk of certain um, outbreaks, and in this case, C. diff, because we know that C. diff um, is easily transmissible, transmissible, especially through contact and, of, unfortunately, our, our, our hands, and also the inappropriate use of, of PPE. Now, moving on to the next slide here, here's another poll. And we're looking at our data table. Let's, we're looking at our infection rates for our facility. And again, this data that I'm presenting, even with hand hygiene surveillance, is fictitious data. It's only for the demonstration of this, um, the, the, for this, for this training. So, looking at our data table, we have infections on the left in the first column, and they are listed urinary tract infection, respiratory infections, skin soft tissue infections, GI infections, and multi-drug resistant organisms infections. And the next column is your numerator. So it's the total number of infections you have per uh, year to date in your facility. And the next column is your denominator. So those are the total resident days that you've identified to calculate the rate which is in the next column with that, and that rate is the number of infections per 1,000 residence days that are year to date. So you've calculated in your facility the particular rate of infections for these UTIs. So, for, uh, excuse me, for these infections. So for UTIs is 3.4, for respiratory infections is 1.6, for SSTIs it's 0.44, for GI infections, it's uh, 0.32, and for MDROs is 0.94. And in the last column to the right, you see a comparison column, and that's where you can look at your previous year's rate compared to your year-to-date date rate. So based on the data in this table, because your table and this data actually tells a story, what HAIs should we be concerned about? And the polling question is um, up and ready for you to uh, answer. So, should we be concerned just about UTIs? Should we be concerned about respiratory infections and GI infections? Should we be concerned about skin soft tissue infections? Or should we be concerned about UTIs and MDROs? And I'll give you a hint. The way you can tell is by looking at your FY FY 2021 rate, and then compare that to the your year to date rate. And most of you all answered correctly. It is D. You should be concerned about your UTIs and your MDROs, primarily because of your comparison uh, rates in your last in the last two columns. You'll see that the rate currently year to date is 3.4 UTIs per 1,000 residence days. Whereas last year's rate, it was 2.5 UTIs. And last year, and, and when we talk about last year, we're talking about a whole full year. So for a whole full year, we had 2.5 UTIs per 1,000 resident, resident days. And now we have 3.4. So that should give us, you know, an indicator that something is going on with our UTI, UTI rates. And there, there must be something causing that or increasing the risk of our residents um, experiencing a UTI. Same goes for the multi-drug resistant organisms. The, the rate last year was 0.68 per 1,000 residence days, and this year is 0.94. So something must be going on to cause that increased risk and also the increased number of infections. So one way that you can help identify both your risk and also your causes for a particular um, healthcare associated infection is through conducting a uh, root cause analysis. And a root cause analysis basically allows you to identify the cause and effect to get to the, the root cause of a problem. And there's a particular resource called the fishbone diagram. And this is a resource that um, actually allows you to look at contributing factors um, under certain um, different headers or areas um, to identify your potential source and problem. So this is what a fishbone diagram worksheet looks like. And here's a link to, uh, to uh, obtain this resource. But if we're thinking about, for example, 
our increase in UTI, so that will go at the top. So we have an increase in our UTIs, that's our problem. What things just off the top of your head might you consider in these different buckets that may be contributing to a urinary tract infection increase in our residents? We can look at environmental factors, staff factors, equipment and supplies, and also, for example, rules or policies or procedures. What might you all be thinking? All right, so I'm going to just throw out some, yes, education and training. Let's say we don't have the appropriate supplies to um, probably, uh, for example, uh, make, like we don't necessarily have uh, indwelling catheter kits. We don't have a standardized process to insert indwelling catheters. Um, our hand hygiene rates may be low. Yes, no process or, or uh, for peri care, no consistency with peri care, dehydration in our, in our residents, great point. Catheter care, no processes for catheter care, that's correct. Let's see, first of all, okay. All right, so yes, these are all. Uh, considerations that when you're going through um, a risk assessment um, and also uh, trying to identify what factors are contributing to your to your increase in, in healthcare associated infections, you can work through this process and identify those buckets uh, for potential causes. And same here, looking at how your surveillance can help tell a story over time. Um, and in this situation, for example, there was an increase in our UTIs, and what we found was that we didn't have a standardized bathing protocol, but we subsequently imp implemented that bathing protocol around April 2021, and then as a result, our UTA rates went down. However, in July through the 2021, through the rest of the year, we started experiencing supply chain issues. We had a change in our staffing, and um, most of the staff reverted back to using bath basins, let's say, for example, for um, especially for our catheter care to, to help um, with peri care and catheter care. And so that subsequently resulted in an increase in our UTIs. However, going through um, the fishbone diagram and a root cause analysis, we identified those subsequent problems, we resolved our supply chain issue, re-educated staff, re-implemented the bathing protocol, and our UTA re UTI rates subsequently dropped from January 2022, and we've maintained that through the rest of the year. So this is just an example of how surveillance can inform your IPC program and your activities. Your how surveillance data could tell your story about what's going on in your facility, as well as identify risk and existing problems. And process improvement tools like the root cause analysis can help you identify those risks and causes that could be leading up to the problem. So thank you all so much for your attention and your participation and your engagement. I hope you found this information helpful. Again, all the tools and resources that I reference are embedded in the slides. And with that, I'm here to answer any questions if there are any. Hey, Erica, there is one question. Um, going back to your rates, can you show the calculations on how you got those um, rates? Sure, sure, sure. Do that very quickly here. So here we here we um this is so we calculate our resident um our rate. So this is how we calculate our res our rate. So we have a total number uh of our infections and we multiply that by a thousand and then we divide that by our denominator days, fifteen thousand eight hundred, and that would give us a total of three point four um resident uh, rate, excuse me, 3.4, for example, UTI infections per resident days. So that's how you calculate your, um, your rate. And again, if there are any um, questions or concerns about like how you use your surveillance data, how you calculate rates, we at Alliant Health are available and more than happy to assist you as well as I know our, our Georgia Department of Health um, partners are as well. So please feel free if you're working through your surveillance data and you need some assistance, just reach out to us. Okay, well, if that's it, um, we have uh, again some, list some resources that are, are here in the slides for you to check out that are referenced all throughout this presentation. 
And we would encourage you all to continue to um, stay tuned to the, the upcoming events that we have here. Um, we have our, our office hours on November 18th at 11 a.m. That's for SNF and medical directors, as well as for assistant living care, uh, facilities and personal care homes. We have an additional training on October 28th, this uh, Thursday at 11 a.m. and then also on November 18th at 1 p.m. Thanks again to our partners at Georgia Department of Public Health, the University of Georgia. Um, without our collab your collaboration and support, this would not be possible. So thank you all again.